I think Mr. Boat may have mentioned it on, on opening, but I want you to talk to the jury about it. You said you were heavy when you were a kid, but, but how big were you when you were 12 years old? Well, when I was 11 years old, um, I made the Little League All-Star team in the Inter Bay Little League in South Tampa by the Air Force Base. I made 196 pounds when I was 11 years old. I was about six feet tall, but it wasn't distributed very well. I ate a lot of junk growing up. Did you have any interests other than sports growing up? Yes, sir. My father uh, bought me a guitar when I was 11 years old, and I loved to play, play the guitar. Did you play the guitar through your teen years? Yes, sir, I did. How about through your young adult years? Yes, sir. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about the music, because at a time in your life, were you, were you actually considering maybe being a professional musician? Well, we, we played for about 10 years. Birthday parties and high school dances where we get to play good enough to play in the clubs and stuff. And then there did become a point in my early 20s where there was an opportunity to go on the road and open up for a national act. And a couple of guys, actually one guy was married, another guy's girlfriend, they both had kids and they didn't want to leave. So that pretty much put an end to me because I didn't want to keep playing the same local clubs over and over. I thought maybe we had a chance to go on. What did you do after high school? Oh my gosh, it's been about uh, two and a half, three years ago on HCC, Hillbrook Community College, and didn't get a degree there, but right before I got a uh, AA degree, I went to the University of South Florida major in uh, finance and management and minor in music. Did you finish college? Had anybody in your family even been to college before you started at HCC? No, sir. Did you want for anything growing up? What was your youth like in your house? As a child, I mean, how big was your house? Well, it was a small house. It was, uh, it was a small wooden frame house about half the size of this room. And uh, my brother uh, and I were big kids, so we couldn't really put it. We had one room, so we could put a bed in there. Two beds, I mean. We had to uh, kind of sleep from one corner to the corner with our feet because uh, the room was really small. Did you, did you have any other sort of jobs? Before you became a wrestler, what else did you do? I mean, we've talked a little bit about baseball. We've talked about college for a little bit, musician. What else did you do for a living before you became a professional wrestler? Well, before I became a wrestler, my main focus was music. And the bands would break up and they started over, so I was probably in seven or eight different bands throughout the years. But after the first couple of bands, I had a friend of mine who played the band that was in the uh, labor regime. So when the band broke up, he took me down there and I got in the labor regime. So when you go to the labor regime, you would get a sit there in a room and punch it. He'd come like this and you get a ticket to go to work with concrete or go to work with a uh, construction woodworker or a metal worker or a steel worker, so I did that off and on. And in between bands, I also got a request to go to work on the docks to work with all the I got really good at loading the ships to where I finally ended up on top of the ship working with the stevedores. So all that went on and all those odd jobs went in between different bands and different music before I became impressive. Was that after college, during college? What led to professional wrestling? Um, I loved it. My father took me to the wrestling matches on uh, Army, uh, Army, Armenia. Was the Army? Or, or the Army, yes. On Howard. On Howard Avenue in Tampa when I was about nine years old. And the first time I saw it, I just fell in love with it. It was just addicted to me. I was always a, a wrestling fan. I'm sorry for your question. My question was what led you to professional wrestling? So. Well, <laughs> That led me to just becoming a fan and then growing up and finally I got an opportunity. How did you get your first opportunity to get into professional wrestling? 
Well, I would kind of chase the wrestlers around because we didn't have uh, any, I didn't have a football team or a baseball team or anything. So baseball was, I mean, wrestling was a hit sport for all the kids. And so we would kind of chase them around and found out where they would eat lunch at. And we would sit and watch them eat lunch. And then during the week, they would take a TV show uh, off Kennedy Boulevard. So we would kind of chase them around there. And I just started working out, and you know, I didn't realize I was not in, in good, great shape yet. So I was standing there and, and try to look as big as I could. And I kept asking and asking and asking who to talk to. And uh, I think I drove them crazy enough to where they finally gave me an opportunity to get in the ring. You know, I didn't know at the time they were just trying to get rid of me. So the first day they got in the ring, they took me in there. They exercised me with a bunch of exercises I wasn't used to. And then when I got in the ring, they broke my leg the first day. And uh, I'm upset with that really bad because I didn't know what I was up to. And then once I got better, I went back and I made a decision no one was ever going to hurt me again. And I kind of let me sticking with it and spending about two years learning how to wrestle before I had my first real chance to wrestle the match. Well, you're back to something you said. This is around what time? Is it mid 70s or yes, early 70s? Mid 70s, about 75, 76. Or so. And at that time down here, we didn't have any professional sports, right? No, sir, we did not. Explain the wrestling industry at that time to the jury. Give them an idea maybe of how different it is now compared to what it was back then when you broke into it. Well, it's very different now because nowadays you get paid to train and they've got performance centers different wrestling schools you can go to. I try to explain it to people. I say, nowadays you can get a pair of boots from Santa Claus, and then you can go to a wrestling school and get paid to wrestle. Um, but back in the day when I was wrestling, there weren't very many wrestlers, so if you were to walk in the locker room, like I did the first time, if there were six men there, we had to take somebody's job away from them or, or be better than them to take their spot to get in the wrestling business and there was no wrestling fake or wrestling to show you didn't even say those words because they punch you right in the face because there were no lawyers and no lawsuits around that stuff. So it's a different environment, I think. It was very aggressive and, and uh, they were very protective of the so-called fake wrestling word that a lot of people use. What's the, the, was there a word they used for that back then? The sort of the, the way they kept everybody uh, in that disguise that it was real all the time? Well, there was a general word called kayfabe, which means if you and I were talking about wrestling or something, or someone was to walk up and go, okay, we're talking about it. And that was just the general theme, and you protected the business. And, you know, if someone said it was fake, if someone said it was a show, that was a, a reason back then to become aggressive and put it into place. And it was still portrayed as, as a legitimate sport at that time, right? Yes, sir, it was. Um, you had mentioned the training and getting your leg broken. You kept using the word they. Who was your initial coach or trainer or mentor in the sport? Um, there was a, a Japanese wrestler named Hiro Matsuda that was very, very hardcore, and he put me with him. Um, and he's the guy that broke my leg the first day. And the funny part of the story is we became good friends as I stuck it out and we came back and later on my career he actually came with me to Japan because I spent many, many years in Japan and wrestling and actually came Japan, to Japan with me as my mentor and he was very proud of me. Whether it was then or, and we're going to talk about how your career progressed into more of the product that's out there today, but is the sport hard on your body? Yes, sir. It's um, one of the things I try to explain to people. Um, the word fake doesn't really describe it. It is predetermined when you know who's going to win or lose. But, like in my instance, um, it's, it's very physical. And in the 25 plus years I wrestled, I've had two knee replacements, two big replacements, nine back surgeries. This one, in my eye, I all kinds of surgeries. And so I even have teeth marks on my fingers from people biting me, just crazy stuff. So it's very physical. Or it, it, it was very physical then, it's very physical now. But the equipment's much better, the brain is much safer, the 
not holes or pumps in it or anything, so there's a much better chance of surviving in there. But even, even the young can still get hurt all the time. So we're up to a point where you, you maybe break in and have your first professional matches. Was there a time that came when you actually started wrestling for money? Yes, sir. And could you tell the jury how that started for you, the early, early days of your career and what that was like? Well, when I first started wrestling, um, I wrestled in this what was called territory. It was for championship wrestling. It wasn't the big WWE as we know it now. And I would go from Tampa, Miami, and drive to Tampa, Dallas, and drive, and we'd actually wrestle in Tampa. And I pretty much made 20 or 25 dollars a night, which you know, by the time you pay for gas and ate something and stuff, it wasn't close to even back then, it wasn't enough money. And again, let's try and you know, help the jury a little bit. Time-wise, when are we talking about? We're in the 70s, obviously, right? Yes, sir. Um, that's my recollection of late 76, 77, is when I was just starting out on this area. Did you keep it up? Did you, did you ever quit? Well, once you started getting paid. Yes, sir. And why'd you do that? I just couldn't make enough money to eat or live. What did you do in the periods of time where you stopped wrestling once you had actually started professionally? What did you gap fill with in those times where you quit? Did you have other jobs? Yes, sir. I would pretty much go back to the, uh, the docks or go to the union hall and get a ticket to go to work construction somewhere. Did there come a time when you were actually able to make enough money to at least live on as a professional wrestler? Well, I got kind of resourceful. I went back to wrestling after I started here in Florida. And when I went back to wrestling, I went up to the Alabama area. And it, it, it took a while. The first two years I slept in my car. And uh, it was, it was, uh, it was pretty good test. It kind of gave me a foundation to appreciate things. You know, and, and really get things in perspective. So I didn't take things for granted. And I actually became kind of a cheap state. After about the first year, I kind of had enough money to get a car. So I was saving money, so I kind of stayed in my car. I finally ran an apartment. And uh, how long did this, you said you were in Alabama, how long did that last for? That's probably six, eight months, six to eight months. Where'd you go after that? Well, I had to quit. They were done and I didn't have anywhere to go. And when you're done wrestling in the area, territory, you didn't have another job on that. And I wasn't skilled enough to have another job on it. So I came back to Florida for just a couple of months and then I got rehired again in Memphis, Tennessee. When you say another job lined up, you mean a wrestling job or? Yes, another, another wrestling territory to go to continue wrestling. All right. And when you came back to Tampa, did you go work on the docks again? You went to Tennessee next, is that what you just said? Yes, sir. Where'd you go in Tennessee? Well, I, I drove to Tennessee, built Tennessee to be the promoter, uh, Jerry Jarrett, and he hired me, and he gave me an $800 a week guarantee, and uh, he bought me a car because I was driving about 2,500 to 3,000 3, miles a week to go from Memphis and Evansville, Evansville, to Louisville, Louisville, back to Chicago, Mississippi, um, Birmingham, Alabama. It was just crazy. I had six guys in the car and we were trading off driving. And some nights we'd wrestle, get the car, drive all night long to get where we're going. And we're out kind of work out and go wrestling. So it was, uh, it was a pretty good test. About this time, were we talking late 70s? Yes, sir. What was your next step after Memphis? Was your next step after Memphis to what's now known as the WWE, or were you somewhere after Memphis before that? Yes, sir. I was just getting ready to go there and go back to the boss. And I uh, got a call from Vince McMahon Sr., and he heard that I was in pretty good shape and um, was getting a good, good response on the Memphis area. He asked me to come up to New York for an audition. All right, now let's, let's take a couple of things I want to follow up on. When you talk about this idea of driving around in the car from Louisville, Birmingham, wherever, I mean, that wasn't just your life. I mean, that was a, a wrestler's life, I take well, yeah. it. That's, that's what you did. You drove. Some guys have it worse than others, especially if you have like 
championship dogs and hunt team and actually go farther into other areas, into other territories for us when I come back. So no one that I knew of flew at that time. What was your name, your, your professional name back then? What were you wrestling at? Well, I started as a super destroyer, and then I was Terry Golder, and then Sunday, a promoter of mine changed my name to Sterling Golden, and then I changed it myself back to Terry the Hulk Golder. And then when I got to New York, Mr. Cam said he liked it in Hulk, but he put Hogan on him because he had a territory in New York that all the wrestlers were ethnic based. Like Chief J. Strongbow for the Native Americans, one of the same ones here for the Italian Americans. And he wanted me to be Irish, like Paul says, an Irish wrestler. And for the jury's benefit, this would have been about Maureen in the 80s yet yeah, when you no. officially get that professional name? That's what we wanted. It was 70, mid 78, 79. Where did where did the at the time that what's now it's now known as the WWE but back then what was it called? It was a well when I first went there it was called World Wrestling uh, Wide World Wrestling Federation then it changed right away to World Wrestling Federation WWF. Where did they build the characters Hulk uh, Hulk Hogan is coming from? Well, Venice Beach, California. Were you born in Venice Beach? Yes. Did you grow up in Venice Beach? The, the move to WWE, uh, well, let's call it, I'm going to call it WWE just for everybody's benefit. You know, so I'm not going to go back and call it WWF, right? So we're on the same page, right? All right, so the move to WWE at that time, was that a big move for your career? Yeah, it was huge because um, the WWE was known as the Madison Square Garden or Eric Ariel. They said this is what the big man wrestled. So a lot of the guys that I wrestled back in that time were a lot bigger than me. Even though I was right around 300 pounds, I was considered a medium-sized wrestler. Back then, back then the wrestlers were much larger with big arms and big bellies, and they looked like wrestlers. Um, did your career reach a, a sort of new level? Or let's take it this way. Did that character, that Hulk Hogan character, character take you to a new level of popularity as a wrestler? Yes, sir. Yeah. Can you explain to the jury sort of this point in your career when you're in the WWE and this character starts to gain some popularity? Well, when I was in the WWE, it was much different than the other areas I wrestled because I was usually wrestling in high schools or BMW buildings and stuff like that. And when I went to the WWE, it was a large Philadelphia Spectrum or Madison Square Garden or Boston Garden, so it was day and night and more night and night than before. Were you wrestling as a good guy or a bad guy? I started out as a bad guy there. And could you tell the jury in the industry, because it may be thrown around in this trial, what they call bad guys in the industry? Well, bad guys are called heels and good guys are called baby faces. Did you at some point become a good guy, a baby face? And at that time, how was the reception you were getting in these bigger auditoriums? As a bad guy. As a good guy. Uh, but let's do this. Why don't you tell the jury when you changed to a good guy and why? Well, I wrestled uh, with the WWE from 78-ish right about 1980. And then I got called to do a movie. Uh, by Sylvester Sloan, uh, the Rocky Three movie. And I told Vince McMahon, senior, about it. He said, you're a wrestler, you're not, not an actor, that's the mentality back then. And he says, if you do the movie, you'll never work here. So I went and did the movie, and he fired me for doing the Robin Tree movie. So after that, I went back to Japan, where I've been wrestling part-time. And I got a call from a promoter, a guy named Vern Johnny from Minnesota, from Minneapolis, Minnesota. And when he brought me in, I was supposed to be a bad guy. And I was supposed to wrestle another wrestler named Jesse Ventura. And the moment I got in the ring with him, even though I was this evil wrestler, all the people cheered for me. And fans kind of predicted who I was, and we just went because it worked. You talked about Rocky III. Did that change your career? Yes, sir, it did, because everybody thought Sylvester Stallone was a seven-foot-tall monster in the eyes of the public. And when they saw me, when they saw me standing next to Stallone, they went, oh, my gosh, he's out of the wrestler. So, Immediately, I could tell the public that the movie had made an impact, 
I was not recognized before at all, and all of a sudden, most of the people knew me from what was the guy from Rocky who did it to the Nostro. What was the name of the character you played in Rocky Three? And taking it back to where, where you were just telling the jury a little more about your, your story, when that was done, you still had to go back to wrestling, I take it. Oh, yes, that movie was like 10 days to come. You went to Japan, you came back, you were wrestling for this man, Vern Gagne. Was that a different organization than WWE? Yes, sir. It's called the <laughs> AWA, American Wrestling Association. It's based in Minnesota, but it went all through Canada. And sometimes we go to Chicago and mainly drove, but when we went Did you eventually get back to WWE? Yes, sir, I did. And could you tell the jury when that happened and why? Well, I wrestled in Minnesota for about three years, and I figured out how to be a Hulk Hogan character, and the guy was shaking, and it's just the whole voice, hey, brother, let me tell you something. I figured all that stuff out. And so, we had this great group of wrestlers in Minnesota, we planned on going to New York, you go into their, into their area, the WWE area, the promoter of Mariani bought T, Tom and Champagne in New York, and all up and down the East Coast, and the word was out that we were coming with this whole really good wrestling group. And Vince McMahon Jr. called me up and said he wanted to talk. So we flew to Minnesota, came to my home, we talked for five or six hours, and we shook hands. And the next day, I left Minnesota and went back to the WWE where they said they would never hire me again. Vince Jr. was taking over for his father, and he wanted me to come back and be a good guy there. Some of the jurors may remember earlier, some may remember sort of the very sort of prominent years in your career. Was there, was there an event when you went back to WWE that started you on a completely different level of popularity as a wrestler? Oh, yes, sir. Can you tell the jurors uh, what that event or events were, for that matter? Well, when I went back, it started out that this horrible character in the Iron Sheik. And he was a wrestling character, but the man who was the wrestling character in the Iron Sheik was the real deal. He was actually the Shaw of our man's bodyguard. And he was in the AAU, he was a national champion. He was a real wrestler, he just happened to use the, the character of the Iron Sheik. So he was the real deal. And when I came back, the political environment was the United States was having a lot of trouble with Iran at the time and politics. So it was a perfect storm. Paul Cody came back as a good guy. The people knew they should cheer me because I was in Minnesota for so long being cheered. That when I came back and they played the Eye of the Tiger music in the Rocky movie, and I went to the ring. I just remember on the way to the ring before I wrestled the Iron Sheep to win the WWE title. It was just, I've never heard anything that loud before. So the moment I won the belt, Everything that we took off, and then shortly after that, we had the first WrestleMania, where we had uh, just, that was the first of the entertainment, sports entertainment, where we had Cindy Lauper, and Mohammed Ali as the referee, and Billy Martin, the man for the Yankees, and uh, uh, just this goes on and on, and so many celebrities there. Those couple, a couple of events really launched my career, this whole thing. When, when was, when you say we, we had Wrestlemania, when was the first Wrestlemania? Well, I won, I won the belt pass in Spurgard in January 23rd, 1984. So the best of my recollection is like the next year, the following year, on March and April, the first Wrestlemania. And this, as you were describing, would have been a time where the sport, the sort of raw nature of it as a sport, it was presented more at that time as more of an entertainment thing. Yes, we did. We turned out publicly and said wrestling was an exhibition. And what we were trying to do, we were trying to get all the, the beer drinkers and the cigar smokers in the front row that want to see blood. We were trying to get rid of them. We were trying to get the families in the front row. And so we told everybody, look, wrestling is an exhibition. You know who's going to win or lose. And it's fun. You know, it's safe. And there's not going to be the hardcore wrestling like that's what it is about, is when we quit trying to solve the public's intelligence and say, hey guys, look, this is entertainment. This is not a real sport. Everything we're doing here 
in wrestling and yeah, that's all open is just to entertain that's what really took off. Did does the word sports entertainment accurately describe how they were referring to it at that time? Is that a fair characterization? That's fair. It took a little while to get some of the guys up to speed because we were Did the physicality of it change at all? Um, I want to talk. All right, and so for the jury's benefit, if they, they've watched wrestling or if they watch it, when they see someone jump off the top rope and land on somebody else, that part of it is physically what they're seeing, right? Well, if I was to jump off the top rope on you, I would do everything I could. We don't want to do that. <laughs> Not in here anyway. You don't want to go off the top rope, But if I was to go to the top rope and jump on you, I would do everything I could to protect you. But you have to make contact with what we call it. Going back to the injuries you've suffered, though, that those were injuries that were a consequence of some of these moves not being fully protected, or maybe just whatever happens in the ring. Is that fair? That's kind of fair. I think a lot of the injuries that happened to the back surgeons were probably because I wrestled too long. Um, we've talked about the character, we've used the word character, the Iron Sheet character, the Hulk Hogan character. Um, I, I want you to, to, to try and explain this to the jury. When you talk about the Hulk Hogan character, well, what's the personality of that character? Oh my gosh, the Hulk Hogan character is uh, the all-American good guy, loud, sometimes not loud, but always in character, um, using slang like brother. And used to have a full head of hair. Um, just the all American good guy, fights for the rights of every man. The whole character theme really was kind of like perfect storm. Like right. Okay, this is a good time. The judge wants to take a comfort break, I think, right now. So. We're going to take a little bit of a comfort break. We're going to some technical technology issues. Okay. Has this not been working the whole time and I didn't know it? Or?
rounded, he has to talk directly in it. It's only going to have a pick up pattern like this. I can analyze you're going to give you a lot of Clearly, this, this is going to be this. What's the problem? My client can't see the It doesn't because like, it doesn't tilt this way. I can't move that elbow. Yeah, they don't have that. They're having type differences out in the other mics down in the media. Probably depends on how tall your witness is. Check. I started out in Tennessee. Then I went to Vermont. Then I went to Massachusetts. Check, check, check. Can you hear downstairs? Can you hear downstairs? means break when you do that. Yeah. I got it. I yes, I understand. Yeah, it's already been adjusted. You can just talk about it. Yeah.
Your Honor. Mr. Bill, are you good? Yes, sir. Okay. There you go. Um, where, where were we were at before that recess was you describing the attributes of the personality of the, the Hulk Hogan character. So just to kind of take the jury back to where we were before we had that break, could you describe the character Hulk Hogan for the jury, please? Um, the character is larger than life. It's uh, the all-American character. The theme of the training prayers and vitamins and believe in yourself is like what we'd call the four, deba four demandments of the Hulkamaniacs. And um, the all-American image of the character is tan, full head of hair, used to um, just even my theme song is Fight for the Rights of Every Man. He's the, he's the, the all-American hero in, in, in a nutshell. The character, Hulk Hogan. And, and with respect to these these characters, I mean, as, as a wrestler, when you get a character like that, do you create him yourself? To, does the, the WWE work with you? Is it a combination? Please explain that. Well, when I started wrestling, you had to come up with your own character. And it's changed completely now because now they have writers in the WWE. They've got 25 writers. and. Vince McMahon and his staff develops your character. So you could come in as um, a college athlete, an all-American athlete, and they could change your character to, to a cowboy or a lawyer or anything they want to change it to. When, when are you in character? When are you in character as Hulk Hogan? Me? Yes, sir. Well, it's changed. Um, over the years, it was pretty much a wrestling-related character. But as the years have passed by, I've realized that the moment I leave my home to go get the mail, nobody says, hey, Terry, how you doing? Everybody goes, hey, Hulk, how you doing? Or, hey, Hogan. So when I'm away from my house, it's pretty much 24 hours a day when I'm not at home because no one calls me Terry anywhere. It's always, hey, Hulk, how you doing? We love you. Or you should have lost. Or you're the greatest wrestler. So it's always Hulk Hogan when people see me out, out away from my home. Have you been accepting of that fact? In other words, the fact that when you walk out on the street, you're going to get approached like that? Oh my God, yeah, thank God it's still happening after all these years. <laughs> um, does that include things that, that would commonly happen? Autographs, selfies, things like that? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the first part. Sure, uh, not just getting recognized, but it, would it include things like you being approached for autographs or pictures and things like that? Yes, sir, it would. And have you always tried to accommodate fans of yours when they come up to you in the middle of the day on a public street for that stuff? Well, over the years, I pride myself on not turning my fans down. I mean, there are a few situations where people have been overly aggressive or, you know, I remember one time in particular, I was eating dinner with my wife and kids and some guy got between my wife and I to ask for an autograph and cigarettes fell out in her dish. You know, and it's like... Right. Uh, but I try as, as best I can to be accommodating to everybody. You certainly have accepted the fact, have you not, that you've lost anonymity as the character Hulk Hogan, right? Yes, sir. That's part of the deal is Hulk Hogan. You lose your anonymity. You mentioned that you, when you walk out of the door to your house, are, are there other places where you feel like, like you can be Terry Bollea? Well, I've got a few friends um, in the neighborhood now. Uh, Dr. Crespo is a very good friend of mine. And when I go to his house, I can be Terry Bollea. I mean, there are a few places, you know, a few relatives. Um, when I go to where my children live and I'm in their house, I can definitely be Terry Bollea. Um, but other than that, it's, it's, nowadays it's pretty limited, you know, because the Hulk Hogan character is known worldwide, so it's, it's hard not to be Hulk Hogan. Everybody calls me Hulk Hogan everywhere I go. And, and I want to talk about this issue a little more, but before that, I want you to tell the jury uh, a little bit about who Terry Bollea is as that person differs from the character Hulk Hogan. Well, Terry Bollea is a normal person. Um, wrestling is his job, it is what I hope Terry Bollea does for a living. Um, I don't argue, I'm not loud, um, pretty soft-spoken to a fault, um, don't know how to really 
say no, even though I'm learning how to say no to my kids. Sometimes I've, I've been at fault with um, saying yes when I probably should have said no. Um, but it's the, the character Hulk Hogan is completely opposite of, of Terry Bollea. Um, the only similarities to me are maybe sometimes the look, you know, and for different reasons. I wear a bandana on my head as Hulk Hogan because that's the established look. And sometimes I, sometimes I wear a bandana as Terry Bollea for other reasons. Well, why, why does, you know, why would the person that you are, the person that grew up down on the docks and all that, why does that person wear a bandana as opposed to Hulk Hogan? Well, it's, it kind of goes back to everything I understand now about kind of like when I was growing up, I didn't want to take my shirt off. You know, I had a real problem with taking my shirt off, even though we lived in this area because I wasn't uh, in good shape. And when I was married, um, there were the normal, when I was married to my first wife, there were the normal things that would go back and forth, um, little arguments you'd have, and sometimes I would hear, you know, you're too old, you're too slow, you're too ball headed, you know. Um, you know, I'd like to get somebody, I'm going to find somebody younger. And the, the ball headed thing kind of hit me because as I've gotten older, my hair has gone way far down. I've got an extra, a really large head. And so, Sometimes when I wear a bandana as Terry Bollea, it's just because it's like a, a self-confidence self thing where if I don't have the bandana on, it's kind of like hard not to look at, you know, how bald-headed I am and how big my head is because I have an exceptionally large head. So it's like a confidence thing or it's a personal thing. I guess I, that's the best way I can describe it. But Hulk Hogan, Hulk Hogan's different because when I'm Hulk Hogan, and I wear the bandana as part of the wardrobe. When I first thing I do is when I get to the ring is I rip the bandana off. And when I'm in character as Hulk Hogan, uh, it's totally different, you know, because I'm I'm out in the zone as Hulk Hogan. You mentioned feeling comfortable at friends' houses. Has it been hard since your career sort of reached that next level after after Rocky Three, WrestleMania, and all that? Has it been hard for you to make close friendships? Yes, sir. It has because uh, there was a period of time where I thought I had a bunch of friends when I was working full time and I was flying 300 days a year and wrestling 400 or 450 times a year, twice on Saturday, twice on Sunday, sometimes three times, you know, during a day if we had a bunch of TV. Sometimes we filmed TV shows during the day and I had to wrestle and I had to wrestle that night. I was always with a big group of guys and, and there's a camaraderie, which I consider friendship but as soon as I started wrestling part-time, or as soon as I wasn't at work, I realized that they were business friends and not real personal friends because there just wasn't um, anything to talk about unless we were actually in the locker room or wrestling or on the road. And as soon as I came home to Florida, it was like everybody has their own lives and stuff, so they didn't reach out to me or they didn't, there, at the time there weren't that many people that actually, um, would call on my phone or even if they did live here they were busy so I just with just a couple days off there was real no close type bond when I wasn't at work so I didn't have anybody no I didn't have a lot of close personal friends I had one one or two or three at the most I thought is it hard for you to trust people not in the beginning but as things went along um, I kind of learned something some of the old timers told me that if you've got one close friend in your life you're a very lucky man i didn't really understand that until i became a little bit older and, and realized that by default or by finding out who people really are i only had a couple close people around me that were that i considered close personal friends who, who were those people over the course of let's say the last 15 20 years who you could could consider your close personal friends well the guy that I'm still really close personal friends with is my wrestling manager. He's not my real manager, he's just a character. His name's Jimmy Hart, the mouth of the South. But his real name's Jimmy Hart. But as the character, he's the mouth of the South, Jimmy Hart. So I've been with him 35 years. He's uh, about 10 years older than me. He's uh, 71 years old. So he's my, I consider him a close personal friend. And I did have another close personal friend, a guy named Ed Leslie who wrestled as Brutus the Barber Beefcake, but he got remarried and 
His new wife and I don't see eye to eye about a bunch of stuff. So he lives in this area, but we don't really talk. And then the other person that I thought was my best friend was Todd Clem, Bubba the Love Sponge. Yeah, his name's obviously come up. I'm sure it's going to come up more in the course of this trial. But I, I want to talk a little bit about Mr. Clem and how you became friends. Could you tell the jury how you first met him? I'll tell you what, before we talk about that, let me ask you this. During the time, are you friends with Mr. Clem right now? No, sir. During the time you were friends, if you could maybe d describe for the jury who you knew as Todd Clem, a.k.a. Bubba the Love Sponge, versus the radio personality they may have heard or may have not heard, uh, if you could des describe him as you knew him. Well, before I met Todd Clem, or Bubba the Love Sponge, I knew who he was before I met him. I'd heard him on 93.3. It was a radio station in Tampa, and I just could not stand him. His character was just nasty, overbearing, um, just said horrible things on the radio. So I couldn't stand the character of Bubba Lesbunch. So my ex-wife was opening a new restaurant called The French Hen, and Bubba Lesbunch had the um, most popular radio show in this area, so she wanted me to buy advertising on his radio show for her restaurant. And so when I did that, they got a hold of Jimmy Hart, my manager, wrestling manager, and said, oh, would Hulk come on the, the air? And Jimmy kind of told me and my ex-wife at the same time, and, and my wife wanted me to do it, so I did it. And when I was at the radio station, he was that character, that bubble the love sponge, arrogant, cocky, nasty to people on the phone, he'd hang up on people very demeaning and I was in this radio studio and I just couldn't wait to get out of there. And then it was a few weeks later up on Northdale Mabry in Tampa, a friend of mine named Brian Blair was opening a Gold's Gym and I was there for the grand opening and lo and behold a couple chairs down from me was this 500 pound Bubba the Love Sponge sitting there. He was at his biggest at that time. and. I got there early because I knew there were some special children in wheelchairs, there were some VFW guys there. So I got there early because once the line gets going, it's hard to spend time with them. And I really like to meet people, look at them in the eye, shake their hand, and, and kind of like interact with them so they know that I appreciate what they've done being a fan and supporting me. But it's, goes, it's extra special with these children and kids and veterans that I like to really make them realize I appreciate who they are and what they do. And when I went to this autograph signing, Bubba was there. And I watched him treat these people with such grace and such dignity. It just, just caught me off guard. I, my God, I couldn't believe that I had judged this guy by what I had heard on the radio and his character. So I watched him throughout the day. And the autograph signing was supposed to be two hours, as I remember, it was about five-hour autograph session it turned to, and this guy treated every single person with respect that came up for the autograph and this, that, and the other. And I went up to him and I said, you know, I made a mistake. I thought you were a nasty person, and I've watched you all day, and I appreciate the help you've given me and my wife, and thank you for everything. And that kind of opened up the door, and I don't recall how it happened for future uh, communication, but we became so close that we started training every day together, and he went from 500 pounds over a period of seven years down to 250 pounds. And I got him on the cover of, well, I didn't get him on the cover, but he got on the cover of uh, Muscle and Fitness, which is a bodybuilding magazine. And we just did everything together um, to the point where um, he helped my daughter with her music. Um, he helped my son with the stuff he wanted to do. And I went through a really tough time, you know, when my father passed away. And Bubba was there in the room, and Bubba had one of my father's hands. I had the other, one of my other father's hands, and as he took his last breath, Bubba was there with me, and he held, he was holding my father as my father passed away. So there was never any question of, you know, who he was or, or what he meant to me. And, um, you know, I, I believed in my heart he was my best friend, and he's the guy that I valued as 
the go-to guy if I was having problems in my marriage or if I was having business problems. I needed somebody to talk to. And uh, it just evolved over the years. This guy was, I believe, was really my best friend. I mean, we'd go on vacations together. We, we, we did everything together. You talked about problems with your, your first wife. Is that, that's Linda Belay, right? Yes, sir. When, when did you marry Linda? How, how long ago did you get married to her before you divorced? Uh, we got married uh, December 18, 1983. When did you start having problems? And I don't mean like day-to-day -day problems, but real marital problems with Linda. Well, I... After three years of marriage, before we had children, I had a conversation with her mother, and I said, I'm having a little bit of a problem with the personality and a few other issues, and that's the first time I remember saying anything to anybody about having some problems, and her mother looked up in the eyes, and she goes, well, you married her. And I was like, okay, what does that mean? So it, it kind of started then, but it was just the normal marriage stuff, because we were just trying to, we were three years into the marriage, and we were just kind of like really figuring each other out and kind of, you know, getting, you know, everything was okay except just a couple of little weird things that were going on. I just talked to her mom about it and that's when I first remember the first little glitch in the system. Then it wasn't something I couldn't live with. When did you start experiencing the marital problems that ultimately led to the divorce? Uh, well, it escalated. I would say it really started escalated around around 2004, 2005, 2006, and peaked around 2006 or seven. Who filed for divorce, you or Linda? Oh, Linda did. And do you remember when that was, what year and month, if you can remember the month? It was November 2007, the best of my recollection. I want to focus on this time frame you just described for the jury, because at or about that time, 2004, 2005 through 2007, was when the reality show, Hogan Knows Best, started being filmed and put on TV, right? Yes, sir. Can you tell the jury how that started the process of you getting this reality show? I had been uh, helping my daughter with her music, and reality, uh, excuse me, VH1 was a music channel, and they had a series of one-hour specials called Inside Out. And, you know, they found out that Hulk Hogan's daughter was doing music, so they called me and said, would you do one of these inside out specials? So I said, yes. It was to help Brooke's career. And it was called Hulk Hogan Stage Dad. So we did the one hour special about Brooke's music and me trying to help her get going. And they aired it and it got really good ratings. So they came back to me and asked for more programming. But they asked for it in the um, form of like an Ozzy Osbourne Kardashian type reality show. That's how it got started. Did you talk to your family about it? Yes, sir, I did. And could you tell the jury what you told your, your family, who at that time was Linda, Nick, and Brooke, right? Yes, sir. What you told them about the opportunity and whether it was something that was a good idea? Well, I did have a meeting, a family meeting with them, and I remember sitting there and telling them about the opportunity from VH1. And I said, but I need to warn you guys that this is real work that they actually put a microphone on you in the morning and you have to work all day until you're off work and it's they sometimes are very very long days and I want to also warn you that all the stuff you see happening to me whenever I go out in public whenever I walk out the front of the door there's always an autograph and a picture and when you're going to the airport or when you're eating dinner people are going to come up to you and you're going to lose your anonymity and I explained to my family what would happen if the show took off and it became popular and I was also in my mind thinking that if I kind of like did the show, it might help my marriage because it's pretty much dysfunctional at that point. And I thought maybe get us back on track because my ex-wife was, you know, what about me? What about me? I've supported you all these years and I didn't follow my dreams and stuff like that. So I thought maybe this would help. And so when I asked my family if they wanted to do it, everybody raised their hand. They wanted to do it. And it was one of those things that I thought, I, in my heart, I thought it would really help. And so when they did it, I was, I didn't worry about it too much at the time because I thought this will be good for us. Explain if you could to the jury how this particular reality show was shot and, 
in the sense of maybe describing to them whether it's really true reality every second of the day with no script? Well, it's, um, I found out very quickly that reality TV is not real TV. It's, it's real like. Um, what happens is they come up with the themes of the show. And Hogan knows best was the name of the show. And, and for example, the first week was Hulk Hogan takes his dog to a, a psychiatrist. You know, and the next week is Hulk Hogan and his family decide to go ride horses in Montana. Um, and it would, they had themes that they would come up with, and it was either eight or ten different shows per per, per uh, series. They had themes they would come up with, and then every day we'd get a sheet, and on the top of the sheet it would say the call time, which means what time you had to be on camera. And, you know, for each theme they would have, okay, this morning we want to accomplish this, before lunch we want to talk about the family vacation, and then everything was written on, on what the plan was for that day. And then when we put the microphones on and they, okay, you guys are all sitting down at breakfast, they would tell us what they wanted us to say. We want you to talk about how runny the eggs are. We want you to talk about how you're afraid of horses. And we want to talk to you about should we go to Hawaii instead of Montana to ride horses. And usually, I don't ever remember getting the okay the first time. Usually we'd do it two or three times, we'd get in a rhythm. We get the, the magic, the little argument between me and my wife or the kids would argue and if we missed a point the producers would go, okay, Nick, you did everything great except you want to ride a horse bareback, you've got to say that. And they would tell us exactly what to say until they got what they wanted. They'd go, okay, cut, all right, let's move on to the next scene. So it was lightly scripted but they actually told us what to say the majority of the time. So it was kind of easy, you know, but you kind of like tried to have some magic or they were praying for magic such as if the dogs weren't allowed in the house, they were hoping that Nick would actually let the dogs in the house and they were hoping that the dog might go to the bathroom on the floor and cause an argument or something. So they were hoping for magic, but they told us what to say and scripted it out. Were you in character during the filming of the show? Yes, sir. Even down to the voice you used at times? Well, the show was called Hogan Knows Best and it was a, a broadening of the character. Instead of the wrestler, hey brother, what you doing? It gave me artistic liberty to be Hulk Hogan the father, Hulk Hogan the dad, you know, Hulk Hogan the parent. But it was all character driven because it was called Hogan Knows Best, not Terry Belay Knows Best. And that's why they sold the show because it was Hulk Hogan and how he was interacting with the Hogan family. Linda Hogan, Nick Hogan, Brooke Hogan. There was no real Belay show. So it was from top to bottom, it was character driven. Did it do anything to help what was then your rough relationship with Linda? At first it did. At first she was very um, excited about filming. She was very excited about going on the press tours. She was very excited about being on the red carpet and the camera. And kind of like at first it got to the point where she seemed to like the celebrity and like working and like the hours at first. Did that go on or did it change over time? It changed. Um, I think the thrill wore off pretty quickly when everybody realized that it was actually really hard work and the days were really, really long. And there were a lot of extra things you had to do, voiceovers after each show. You'd have to drive to Orlando and go in a studio and talk over your own voice. Even if everything was recorded perfectly all day long, you still had to go over and watch yourself on the screen and talk over your voice. And that was long, too. And, and then I think it got to the point where by the second, maybe going into the third series of shows, we were having a hard time getting everybody to come downstairs, getting everybody to work, and getting everybody to step up and, and keep doing this hard job. How was Linda treating you at this time? On camera, she was uh, very professional. Um, as soon as the cameras were off, we went our separate directions and she was um, kind of neutral at first. But then I noticed something kind of changed and she was very aggressive about wanting to live in California and move home and um, distance herself from me to where 
things changed completely. At some point, did she move? Yes, sir. Do you remember when? Oof. Just maybe to give you some guidance, if the show was on from 05 to 07, I don't know if that helps. Well, no, but there was a point before the last season where she did move back to California, and she showed up late for the, the beginning of the final season. And once they set up production, and once they set up the crews, and there's 50, 60, or 70 people in town on the payroll, in hotels, with production facilities, VH1 is losing money when you're not working. So she didn't show up the first week. They kind of called me on the carpet for it. I said she'd be here Monday. She didn't show up the second week. And then they were threatening to sue. And then when she did come back, we worked really, really hard to play catch-up ball. And the last week was very important to make up all the work she missed at the first two weeks. And she left before the last week. But she had already moved her stuff to California. And she was chomping at the bit to get back there. But that was the big move to California, but before that, before that final season, she had kept going back to California all the time and sometimes sometimes wouldn't even tell us. How did you feel when she moved out? I felt um, that, you know, there was going to be a chance, you know, that maybe she would come back, but it was tough because it, it was almost like Instead of just moving out, her actions changed. You know, like if I went by and said good morning to you or just touched you, it went from good morning to almost a snarl when she looked at me. So I couldn't really even touch her because there was something that changed drastically, and I'm not exactly sure how or why. Did, did the marriage ever get back together after she moved out? No, sir. I, I want to um, shift gears now. Um, at some point in time, while this is going on, had you been, uh, did, had, had Bubba, the love sponge, Bubba Clem, Todd Clem, whatever we're going to call him here, and Heather started talking to you about potentially having sexual relations with her? Yes, so they did. Can you tell the jury how that started when they first started talking to you about it? I remember when I was approached, it was a phone call. And to the best of my recollection, Bob and Heather were together in a car. And um, Bob asked me over the phone, Heather, he called me Hootie once in a while as a joke because that was the name of his dog. Just joking around as a friendly joke. And he would say, hey, Hootie, Heather says she wants to see you naked or Heather wants to have sex with you or Heather wants to see the size of your penis and it, it started out like that you know where it was kind of like joking around but it was it caught me off guard you know it was very weird because I had never been approached like that in all the time I knew him you know and I'd been around him a lot in, in, in my environment and I just was not it, it caught me off guard when they first approached me how well did you know Heather I didn't know her very well at all. Um, I met Heather when they first started dating. And then uh, Bubba has a racetrack that he raced at East Bay, and I saw her at East Bay. And he bought a racetrack somewhere in Ocala. I saw her there. And then I may have saw her at Bubba's house at Thanksgiving one time when they invited me over. But other than that, I've only seen Heather a, a handful of times. Did they continue to talk to you about possibly having sexual relations with Heather? They did. It uh, continued on. It got to the point where I said, look, man, just knock it off. It's not funny. And then it got to be such a consistent thing. It was almost, it almost turned into a joke. Like, okay, I knock it off. It's almost like poking me because they would, they would get me, get a response from me. So it got to the point where it was, it, it had been talked about over the phone and even one time when I met Heather at the racetrack with Bubba. They joked about it in person where I actually thought it turned into a joke. I thought, you know, I knew they had an open marriage because he talked about it on the radio. But I thought with me, it was so many times that they talked to me about it, it kind of turned into a joke. Like, you know, make fun of the guy's bald head or make fun of me because I used to be fat or was teasing him about the sex thing. So I actually took it as a joke for quite a while. It got to that point, I was... Did it ultimately happen? Yes, sir, it did. 
tell the jury how, how it happened the first time that you actually had sexual relations with uh, Heather Klein? Um, it was uh, a situation where a lot of things were happening at the same time. I tried unsuccessfully to get my wife to, to come back and she verbally over and over and over would say F you, F you, I'm not coming back, you're too old, you're too slow, you don't turn me on, I'm gonna find somebody younger. It was constantly being said to me and I was constantly trying to get her to come back because my work was up and down the East Coast and I tried to live in California. I went out there and tried to make it work, but flying from LA to New York or LA to Atlanta two, three times a week, I was so worn out I couldn't even see straight, so I was trying to get her to come back because I was the guy that believed once you put your hand on the Bible and you made an oath under God till death to his part, better or worse, I believed I was real old school and I believed that you should stay married and I always dreamed, I always thought that I would not be the guy out of all these other wrestlers that got divorced, that I would stay married and this period of time would pass and she'd grow out of it or calm down and was, I figured that I kept praying it was just a rough one, successfully tried to get her back several times, my son was in a lot of trouble, I wasn't working, I didn't have a job, and she basically said, I'm filing for divorce, I'm done, I'm not coming back, I'm filing for divorce. All I did was call Bub up and I was just crying like a baby on the phone to him. I just broke down because he, got to, he knew everything, he knew what I was going through. I told him everything that was going on with her and he encouraged me to try to get her back, you know, it'll work out. And it just got to the point where, you know, I was depressed, you know, I was just, at, I, it was like a low point in my life that when Bubba says, hey man, come over to the house, you know, let's talk, you know, I was just so desperate. I went over there, one thing led to another, I just let my guard down. I felt like those people cared about me. I felt like I bottomed out. I felt like I just gave up. I just gave up, gave in, and let my guard down, and it, it just happened. How many times were you with Heather? To the best of my knowledge, three, maybe four, but it was, it was the only place that I actually felt safe, as crazy as that sounds. Those people made me, Bubba made me feel like he was my best friend. Those people made me feel like they loved me. And as weird as it felt, as crazy as it sounds, at that time, it just, it was the only thing I had. It was just, it didn't even make sense, but it just happened. If you could, without getting too graphic, maybe describe for the jury what happened when you went to Bubba's house. Well, when I was at Bubba's house, it was a situation where, I mean, I, was, I had a hard time getting to the house. I was so rattled and upset about everything. And when I got to the house, it was like a group hug when I came through the front door. The door was open. I just pushed it open and walked in. I'd only been to Bubba's house um, three or four times. You know, he didn't invite me over to his house. And I'd only been there three or four times. A couple times to work out, he had a gym in the house. A couple, one time to watch a Super Bowl game, and I remember Thanksgiving. And when I went to the house, I saw the door was cracked open, so I pushed the door open. It was kind of like a group hug. And then Heather just kind of started walking to the bedroom, pulling my hand, and I walked with her. It felt really crazy. And Bubba walked in right behind us and goes, okay, you guys, I'm going to go to my office, and here's a condom. Bubba handed me a condom, and it was all of a sudden, it was just so weird and so crazy. My gut was telling me that this was off, this was wrong, and, and my from the, from the feeling I had, I said, Bobby, you're not filming this, are you? And he just flashed into me. What the hell's wrong with you? I'm your effing best friend. How dare you say that to me? I would never do that to you. And it just kind of like froze me in my tracks. And that's how I ended up staying in that situation. I just, it, it, everything was just so surreal. It, it just, it, that's how it was. When, when did you first hear or gaining knowledge that there was a tape out there? The first knowledge that I heard there, that there was a tape out there was some still images came up. 
and TMZ called me and said, hey, there's a rumor that there might be a, a tape out there, a, a sex tape. It's the first time I, I heard you, a rumor. Do you remember there. what year that was? Gosh, I don't recall. Um, do you remember when you first heard that it was actually published, that a tape was actually put out by Gawker? Excuse me? Do you remember when you first found out Gawker had actually put the tape up? Yes, sir. I was on a uh, publicity tour for Total Nonstop Action, a very small company that I was not wrestling for because I, I can't wrestle anymore because of the injuries, but they had hired me because of my name and wanted me to be the character of the general manager. And I really wasn't a real general manager, it was just a character. And they used the Hulk Hogan name and status to get me on certain shows that a lot of other wrestlers couldn't get on in New York for a media swing. And they had booked a media tour months ahead of time for their biggest pay-per-view called Bound for Glory. And I had went on um, Howard Stern and I had went on the show with Kathleen Gifford and a lady named Hoda. And then in that hotel room, I got a call from my attorney, David Houston, or TMZ to get on a conference call with TMZ. And they confirmed, they said, there's a sex tape out here and we have seen it. And that is, and so to use that as a point of reference time-wise, how, how much, how many months before that, when you're on the Bound for Glory tour, did you initially find out from TMZ that a tape may be out there? Does that help you time-wise at all? Three or four years. Three or four years or months? Um, I know the stills came up and um, it just started escalating. Do you remember what year this was when you first got these calls? 07, 07, all kind of happened around the same time. But the stuff with Heather was like years before, like five years before is what I'm saying. Right. When five you were or six years before. Right. That, that's kind of my point. Bound for Glory was in what year? 07. Show in 2012? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, sir. It's, it's 2000. I'm confused on the dates. 2011, 2012, many years before that actually happened. So when you get these calls, how many years after the, the incident occurs, after when you have uh, sexual relations with Heather Clem, is it? Well, that's what I misunderstood. It was five or six years before. That's why when this whole thing popped up, I was like... When you, when, when you get the first call from TMZ about the stills, what did you do? Uh, call my attorney, David Houston, and to find out what was going on. Did you do an interview with TMZ at that time? You and Mr. Houston? Yes, I think David, to the best of my recollection, got on there and told them that um, I didn't know anything about still pictures being taken and that he would go after and prosecute whoever did this illegally to me. Did you find out whether any other sites had put stills up? We found out that there were several other of these um, sites like that, the, the, the porno type sites that put it up. Were, those, uh, were there stories floating around? Before you find out Gawker puts the video up, were people writing stories about these stills or the existence of a tape? Yes, sir. Did you sue any of them? No, I didn't. Are you used to having stories written about you? Yes, sir. You talked about why you were in New York, I guess, um, for this TNA Bound for Glory tour. I don't know if we talked about TNA, but did you, can you explain to the jury what TNA is or was? Are they still in business? Well, TNA is total nonstop action wrestling. And like I said, it's a smaller wrestling company I was working for, and I was having a lot of surgeries and stuff during that time. I had several surgeries during that time because <clears throat> It was just a, a job I could have to be a general manager. I didn't have to physically wrestle because I couldn't anymore. Uh, you talked about some of these different interviews you did. I want to show one of them to you and show it to the jury right now. Um, and then we're going to talk about it a little bit. If, if we could, um, Exhibit 229. 
Is this a joke? Hulk Hogan. He is right here with me tonight on Showbiz Tonight. Hulk Hogan, one of the greatest wrestlers of all time, just got totally sucker punched after someone leaked a sex tape secretly shot of him some five years ago. Obviously, an incredible invasion of privacy, and the Hulk is rightfully fighting back, even just going to the police to get some help tracking down whoever did this. Hulk is now with TNA's Impact Wrestling, seen every Thursday night on Spike TV. Well, this Sunday night, it is a big TNA pay-per-view event with Hulk. There is a lot I want to know about that as well. But first of all, I want to welcome you to show this tonight. It, it's, Thank you. it's good to see you. I, I have to start off by saying, not that you need my sympathy, but I have a lot of sympathy for you because you endured what we all saw play out as some very public drama years ago. You went through some really, really tough times, but you got through it, and, and you seemed to be on this great path. You sort of stayed low, you got married, you've been working, and then this falls in your lap. I realize you, you take responsibility for the decisions right. you made back then, right. but the sex tape, first finding out that it was shot and then being released, has to have turned your world upside down. Yes, I, I have been through a lot of stuff, and this single-handedly, has flipped my world more than anything, more than divorce, more than a back surgery when they say you're not going to walk, more than my son's accident going to jail. This came out of nowhere. You know, yes, I'm a coward. Yes, I was the guy. Don't, nobody wants to hear the world is me story, but there is one. You know, I was at an all time low, bad decision. These two people were friends, you know, and at the end of the day, at a, at a really weak moment, I made a wrong decision. And to be clear with some people who may not know the whole background of this, this tape was shot around five and a half years ago. It was the time when you were still married to Linda. It was you having sex with your best friend's then wife. Yes, sir. They were still married, but it was all consensual. They all said, yes, you can do this, go ahead and do it. However, uh, you didn't know it was being filmed. Uh, your best friend we're talking about here, the radio personality Bubba the Lutz Bunch, who was apparently nearby. And then from what I understand, Hulk, about six months ago or so, you actually found out that this tape existed all these years later. Tell me what went through your mind when you found this out. You must have been like, tape, huh? Well, the whole thing sounded crazy for my best friend's wife to say, hey, I want to have sex with you. And for over two years, I said, this is crazy as it sounds, you know. And even though he was saying it's fine, you know, they both we're, we're cool about it. So finally, like I said, at a low point, when my personal life was bottomed out, I said, okay, sure, fine. And all of a sudden, you know, I remember saying, hey, we're not filming this. I'm going to get security cameras. No, I'm your best friend. I never do that. So all of a sudden, when the first pictures leaked out, I asked my best friend, and he goes, oh, I have nothing to do with it. So I went away. So when those pictures first leaked out, that you had no warning they were coming, all of a sudden? No, 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 just out of nowhere. They show up. What went to your mind at that moment? I figured it was on Bubba's watch and you're responsible, but he swore he had nothing to do with it. And so if we could fast forward to the day, yeah. I'm coming to New York to talk about a wrestling tour and I'm in time slot. And all of a sudden, before I come here, these things come out. So I wanted to be here. I wasn't going to back out. Yeah, to be clear, you were booked on the show to talk yes. about wrestling long before I yes, did And so I didn't want to hide my tail between my legs. I wanted to tell the truth. So I called Bubba and I said, you're my best friend, brother. Please tell me. Because you got a family, you got a son. I need to know if you did anything. If you did this, because if you didn't do this, I love you forever. If you did this, we were never friends. But he swore to me, you know, he had nothing to do with it. So as of yesterday, last night, people were calling me from TMZ, said they heard his voice. They heard that. I said, I have to see the tape. And have you yet? No, I haven't. Okay. I haven't been back from here. And they say it's the tail ending of the tape. They write down what was said. Uh, right. Now, now, now yeah. right. To, to, to be clear, what TMZ told you was that Bubba is heard at the end of this tape talking about the tape, meaning if the reports are true, he clearly knew that this was being taped. Yes, and if the reports are true, they say he was laughing when he went up to the camera and said, hey, look, this is our retirement. If we ever need it, turn the camera off. And I said, to Harvey, the guy at TMZ, I said, did you see the tape? And he said, no, I didn't. I said, well, then I don't believe it. And then the executive producer came on the phone with Mike Walters and said, they saw it. And I said, I have to see the tape. Have you spoken with Bubba since this revelation that he was on the tape? Well, I had reached out to him before I came here. And I said, this is going full blown. But at the end of the day, if he did it, we were never friends. And, and to take someone that was at an all-time low, set him up, put a camera and then say something about money. I, I can't believe someone would do that to another person. So that's why I'm praying to God. There's something. So I, I gotta ask you though, if it does turn out that it is true, and Bubba was a separate of who leaked it, but that he was a man. I'm gonna find out 
mean, we, but, but, but separate of that, that he was aware of this, as you say, illegal activity of it being taped, that he, he was aware that this was taking place and somehow involved. I mean, this, this guy was your best friend. He's been on this show defending you in the past. We I really, you, really, you really I, have no choice but to... Well, I told my uh, attorney, David Houston, you know, I said, David, this is something that we need to find out who everybody is now. We really need to find out who everybody is. I mean, I want to know who everybody is. I want to know who's involved. Why this happened? Why they would do this to somebody when, with my kids? Thank God my kids have been through so much and they're so old. And my new wife, Jennifer, who's not part of this media or any of this. Yeah. So, I mean, why would someone do that to another person? That's why I'm still holding firm that I'm praying to God who's not involved. Well, you have to realize that if you don't do something about this, this could happen to another person, or whoever did this could do, do this to another person, or maybe there are others that this has happened to already, and all of a sudden they sit on a table, and all of a sudden 10 or 15, 20 years later it shows up. I mean, this happened, I, I don't mean to stand you corrected, but I've been with Jeff for five years. This happened before I met her. Hmm. Judge, for the record, that was Defense Exhibit 229, I believe. Um, Judge, it's... Um, the date of that broadcast was sometime October 2012. 10 9, 2012. Judge, it's been read into the record through, through it being played. I assume our court reporter was taking that down. Um, I would offer at this time the DVD and ask that it be admitted in evidence. No objection. Uh, we'll, we'll get. We'll get D229A. We can clean that up on a break, maybe? Okay. Um, Mr. Bollea, yes, do you sir. remember that interview? I do now. How soon after you had found out that Gawker had published this video, were you in that studio on show, show this tonight? Is that what it was? Yes, sir. Do you remember how many hours after you had found out that was? It was five or six hours later because I did Howard Stern early in the morning at 7 something and then I did the Kathy Lee good morning show which was about eight o'clock we took a couple hours break and that's when the TMZ call came in and then later that afternoon four or five o'clock in the afternoon so probably four or five hours later after I got this news I, was, I went on the show I was pretty all over the place you know it was that same day when I found out how'd you feel I was pretty rocked I felt I felt numb. I just, uh, the news just hit me, you know, that they told me that Bubba was on in the end of the tape, turning the camera off, saying, Heather, if we ever need to retire, this is for our retirement. And when Mike Walters said he saw it and the executive producer saw it, I remember being on the phone with David Houston and I started, my arms had never done this before, my hands started shaking violently and I got off the phone. And I didn't go into a spasm, but it was one of those things where I couldn't quit shaking. David, I, could, I finally answered the, call, the phone back after David called me several times, and he talked me down because he was the only person that I had in my life that I believed loved me and actually just was my friend. And then that interview happened that afternoon, so it was probably four or five hours later. So I was, I was pretty much on autopilot there trying to just still make sense of everything. Um, and again, it's just maybe to be clear for the jury, when you say the call from the TMZ, this was the call you got, not telling you about the existence of the tape, but actually that it had been put on Gawker. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Yeah, that, yeah, that was the, when, when TMZ called and said, yes, we have the tape and we've seen it. That was the first time anybody verified it for me, that they actually had a tape and saw it. I want, I want to show you another interview. You mentioned you on this same tour. And well, I don't know the host name of that, that show, but um, these, these, were, these interviews were scheduled already for your wrestling promotion, right? Oh, months ahead of time, yeah. Because you got to, like Howard Stern has several guests. If you want to get on his show, and good luck getting on there. You know, you have to schedule it months in advance. It's the same thing with Good Morning America or any of these shows because all the different TV shows and stuff try to get their talent, celebrities on the show, so it's scheduled way ahead of time. And so now you're in New York this new topic came up right before this. Did you still go on all these shows? Yes, I did. Um, if we could judge at this time, we're going to play Defense 302. 
I think it's the same day. October, October, October 9, 2012. How do you find out that there's a tape? Like, when did you first? I'd heard rumors there was a tape of the hub. Yeah, it's been in the air for a while. Yeah. Got to let me think for a second. Was it about six months ago or seven or eight months ago? Um, God, who told me? Yeah, who breaks the I can't, I can't remember who told me. Did you, like, 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 someone calls you up and says, hey, there's a tape of you fucking Heather. No, 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 that, that, was, that wasn't said. There was, first off, I'd never made a tape. I'd right. never said, You swear hey, you were not in on this? I swear to God I wasn't. Right, because some people have the theory. There's three theories floating around. One theory is Bubba made the tape. He, like, that's his thing. He gets off on someone, I don't, he gets off on someone else fucking his wife, and he saw that, you know, he tapes this stuff with a hidden camera. That's one theory. The other theory is that, like, maybe Heather and Bubba were into it, and that was their thing taping it. And then the third theory is that you were in on it, and you're like, hey, let's release this fucking thing, and we're going to make a ton of money. Because, because... Why would I wait six years? I don't know. Bro, I wasn't in, I swear to God, I had no idea, you know. You didn't know you were being taped? No, sir. Because if you were being taped also, you wouldn't be on there talking about how, uh, hey, I feel so fat, I just ate another meal, or something like that, right? I mean, you would probably be a lot more... And I'm not trying to be a really pompous ass, but, you know, I'm going to say something right now, I'm probably probably going to live to regret. Um, You know, and, and this thing has totally upended my world, but... The situation I was in, I didn't want to be overly aggressive right. because it was my friend's girl, if you right. know what I'm saying. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Things could have been to a whole nother level. And I was trying to be cool. You know? What do you mean? I'm not getting this. He I'm was not... being polite. He was being Thank gentle. You. Thank you, Rob. You mean you didn't want a banger? No. You did I, just, I, I, you know, when I wrestle guys in the ring, Guys that are my friends, yeah. I'm cool with guys that aren't my friends, I get really much more aggressive. Well, I don't understand what you're saying. How come I'm not catching on? Why well, because I'm, you know, I was, I was just trying to be... Robert, what, is, what, what does Hulk Hogan mean? He was laid back. He, it was just a, sort of like a, a draining the pipes as opposed to a full-on... Affair. Yeah, he wasn't in there doing what I, he really does. Well, you're saying that, in other words, your performance would have been way more intense. I'm not saying anything. I'm just saying it was a bad situation. Oh, I get what you're saying now. You're saying, hey, when I bang a chick who I'm, you know, really into, I behave a certain way in the bedroom. No, it, everything was, was off. You know, it was, I felt, you know, I, I felt guilty about being there. You know, I should have. So know, Bubba said to you, hey, what's mine is yours. She's up for it. Go ahead. It, it, it's not going to upset me. But it does change the relationship. But, I mean, that was awfully nice of him and her, I guess, in a way. Right? In well, a sense. you know, I, I considered both people close friends, you know. Right. There was ongoing dialogue for over two years. About this kind about of thing. About this. And I said, and honestly, just give me a break. Stop. You're joking. It was almost to a point of being funny. Right. And then when I bottomed out, when, when my whole personal life was, you know, I was in a bad situation with, you the know. The divorce? Oh, it was yeah. even before then. It was, it was just, I'd been, you know, this thing's over, you know, you're too old, you're too slow, I'm moving on. You know, it, it's, it's, it's it made all. Made you feel good. No, it wasn't even that. It was just, <clears throat> I knew my marriage was, was really screwed up bad right and i had been and you know until i went through the, the divorce i didn't believe all the stuff that there's such thing as verbal or mental abuse right and i didn't realize that you know because yeah you know, plus you're the big wrestler yeah plus I mean. yeah but you know at the end of the day it's the once i realized you know what was going on i said okay and i'm not trying to make an excuse other than i was beaten down like a dog and you were when, feeling low and you were looking for comfort I too. I wasn't even doing that. My, my wife, you know, had just made a decision that she'd gone back to California. I was at home with the racing team that we had at the time, the drifting team. Right. And it was just one of those things that after a phone call, which was this, that, and the other, and done, over with, F this, F that, F you, click. I just, you know, went, well, by, went by Bubba's to say, hey, bro, I'm going to hang out. And it just was one of those moments I said, hell with it. I'm going to go for it. Just, and it was, you know, it's a huge, horrible decision. It's totally, 
You know, not, never dreamed in a million years there would be a camera in Bubba's house. But I want to add, that in that, for the record, is um, Defense 302, um, which we'll clean up with 229 on our next break. Um, but we'd offer that in evidence also. No objection. Um, first things first, how many times have you been on the Howard Stern show? Maybe three, maybe four. Can you explain to the jury, I mean, there was obviously some graphic language. Yes, the, the way the conversation goes was completely different than the showbiz tonight stuff. Mm -hmm. um, can you just explain to the jury what it's like going on those shows, your expectations as a guest? Well, Howard Stern is, is a show where you have to take the good with the bad. The good part is if you're lucky enough to get on the show, it kind of predicts what we call the New York media swing, and it also influences all the shows in Los Angeles. If you're good enough or Howard thinks you're worthy enough to get on his show, then it kind of opens up a lot of the other doors, like Imus or other people such as Wendy Williams might take you on the show. If you get on Howard Stern, that's the good part. The bad part is he's going to destroy you when you're on there. And I already knew going on the show, because I've been on there a couple times before, that he just tears into you and just destroys you. So you got to take the good with the bad. And once again, Howard Stern is like, Bubba, off camera, he's the nicest guy in the world. On America's Got Talent, he's a different character other than the Howard Stern on the radio. So when you walk in there, you know what you're in for. And it was just a situation. I had just gotten the news a couple days before I went on this media tour that was scheduled that all of a sudden, this whole thing with Bubba's going down in the tape. So I went on there and was just trying to explain as best as I could, thinking on my feet that this is what happened with Heather. And at that point, I still was holding out hope that Bubba did not do this to me. No one had proved to me yet that, that Bubba had done this. All I knew was that um, Gawker had put some sex tape up that I didn't know about that was filmed illegally and I was praying to God that Bubba didn't have anything to do with it. So I was trying to get through the interview, hopefully get to the point where I could talk about TNA, I mean total nonstop action wrestling bound for glory, the, the reason I was booked there anyway. And that's what the Howard Stern show is. It's kinda like it's 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 part it's it's kinda like it, it's kinda like the cost of doing business when you're in the entertainment business and you need to go on all these media things, you never know what question you're going to get asked. So that's why I was there on the Howard Stern show and that's why the content of the show is just so graphic and so vulgar that that's what you know what you're going to get there. Now if I was on America Got Talent, America Got Talent, Howard Stern's other show, and I walked on stage and I said, hey, I'm here to tell you guys about Bound for Glory. None of that stuff would have been talked about. But when he's in the Howard Stern character and I'm there as Hulk Hogan as a character, it's hard to address these type of situations and, and get through it. And I, I tried the best I could. You had mentioned that you had found out about the, the tape a couple days earlier. Do you remember the, the time difference um, between the day Gawker published in those shows, October 9th and 10th, how many days? I really don't recall how many days it was. It was all close proximity. When you got that call from the TMZ sometime around these two shows, and, and I will correct something you may have heard the lawyers all say, I think the show is Tonight Show was on the 10th, I think. It was, but, there were, I was there one or two days, I can't remember. Yeah, the TMZ call, what was different about that, having already known that there was a tape out there? What did they tell you that you didn't? Well, the TMZ told me something different. You know, the, I, I knew before I went to New York that Gawker had put the tape up. But when TMZ called me, they confirmed my worst fears that the only one person that I had left, because my wife had taken off with my kids at that time, the only person I had left was this camaraderie with, with Bubba, my friend. And 
as bad as everything was and as horrible as I felt about it and just everything was going to hell in a handbag, I still held out hope because he was telling me he did not do this to me. I mean, every time I approached him and said anything at all about, you've got to tell me, I'm going on Howard Stern, I'm leaving tomorrow, I've got to know, Bubba, this, I'm, I'm throwing myself on the firing line or I'm throwing myself on the, the sword here, you have to tell me, did you have anything at all to do with this? And he kept saying, no, I didn't. I never would do that to you. F you, how dare you ask me? He kept saying it. So it almost like slapped me in place to where I went and I fought for him. And I told Howard Stern, I know Bubba didn't do this to me. He's my best friend. And I said the same thing the very next interview afterwards with Kathy Lee Gifford on uh, Today Show or Good Morning America, whichever one it is, that I refuse to believe he did this to me. He's my best friend. No one would ever do this to another person. No one would do that. So that's what I found out different. In what, the, the retirement comment? They, excuse they, me? The, the discussion TMZ had with you about what was on the tape. Yes, sir. When they, when they confirmed that Bubba was on the tape and Bubba went up and turned the camera off and Bubba told Heather that this is for our retirement, Heather, it just, I just started violently shaking. I couldn't stop. Let me ask you this. Did you ever, and this may be a silly question, but did you ever consent to Gawker using naked images of you on a video for any purpose? No, sir, I did not. How has this affected you, Mr. Belay? Um, it's turned my world upside down. Um, The main things I, I was concerned about at the time were my children and my new wife, Jennifer. Um, my kids have been through a lot of ups and downs with... I want, I want, when you talk about this, I want you to focus on your feelings about the fact that your family was exposed to this, all right? If you yes, can sir. focus on how you feel about the fact that they were exposed to this, which is what I think you were saying. Yes, sir, it was. And, and um, let me ask you this question. Were you humiliated by this? I was completely humiliated. Um, my family's been through so much. My feeling was... Not again. You know, I've just completely cleaned my life up, you know. Um, I accepted Christ as my Savior when I was 14 years old. I drifted away from that. I reaffirmed my belief. Um, my new relationship is very spiritually based. Um, when I approached my children, I was thank God. I thank God that they know who I am. And as hard of a hit as I knew it would be, I didn't know how they would survive. And I was worried about how it was going to affect everything with my relationship with my children. And, and thank God they understand who I am. Judge, Your Honor. Judge, I, I don't... The... Um... I understand what you're saying. Were you ashamed? I was humiliated. 
But the thing is, my life has changed drastically. I'm pretty hard-headed, but I've learned, you know, and I'm praying that, you know, even in this moment, I'm praying that my new marriage stays together. My, my situation. Just focus on what you feel about the fact okay. that your family was exposed without talking about what they may feel. Okay. If, if you understand that. Um, the, the feeling I have is a feeling that I, I'm torn. My feeling is torn that I don't know if um, my new relationship with this on a personal level, on the Terry Bollet level, is not media based and I'm Torn, I had no idea if my new relationship in my life on a Terry Bollet level is going to survive. Um, what about? It's not that great right now. Let me, let me ask you this: I mean, for, for people that saw the video out there that don't have the benefit of sitting as a jury and listening to you describe the difference between Terry Bollet, the person, and Hulk Hogan, the character, uh, were you were you embarrassed at what it did to? To you as a, a, a person. I was, embarrassed. I was embarrassed what it did to me as a person, but he was, it was even embarrassing as a character. Hulk Hogan was embarrassing. Judge, if I can have a moment to confer, I think we're about done.